This is a period unique in history. And we are destroying ourselves. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Well, things are getting interesting fast, to put it mildly. We already had an overabundance of reasons to be concerned before the shockwave of instability that has rocked the banking system over the past several days. What's likely to happen next? And what should we, as individual investors, be prioritizing now before it happens? These questions will be the key focus of Wealthion's upcoming online conference, which is now only a few days away. In the middle of the chaos of covering the still unfolding bank failures, I've been busily preparing for the conference. And folks, I got to tell you, it couldn't be more timely given what's going on in the world right now. So I thought I'd give you a sneak peek of the caliber of the experts and the content we've lined up for this event. I recently recorded Dr. Mark Faber's presentation. He is the well-known editor and publisher of the Gloom Boom Doom Report. And we then spent another 20 minutes afterwards talking about where all of this growing instability is likely headed. Mark's been kind enough to give his permission for me to share this bonus footage with you here. Enjoy. Well, Mark, we just had a phenomenal conversation uh, for Wealthion's conference. Um, but while I have you still here, I'd love to get your thoughts. A lot of what you said seemed to almost sort of prophesize that we're, we're, we're barreling towards uh, a period of, of history here where the folks that are running the system, um, that the, the collateral damage of their decisions just continues to mount up until some point where we, we hit a breaking point. And yes, it might be a, a, an economic or a financial one, but it really does seem like we're barreling more towards like a social breaking point. Right where so much wealth has been concentrated in the hands of so few, given the policies that have been running to date, and the pain of the the bad policies is really falling more on the bottom ninety nine percent. And and you were talking earlier specifically the middle class that the wealth from that group is really just getting wrung out of it right now. Um, and you know history shows that that when you lose a middle class. Uh, and when you get a, a, a you know a cadre of elites that are running the system, when times get tough, everybody else has no other option except to rise up and remove who's in power. So I'm just curious, how do you think this ends in the end? Here, do we do we avoid some sort of big social unrest, or or is, is it inevitable? Yes, at this I, point? You see, some of my friends they strongly believe in the World War Three scenario, where countries go to war. I'm not so sure about this, but I think it is quite possible that we have sorts of civil wars. I mean, you, you look at France. Okay, I have no high opinion of Macron, the current president, but he is right in the sense that when social security and the pension system was introduced in the US and in Europe in the 1930s, the the uh, median uh, expectancy of life was much lower than it is now. When they introduced social security in the US, uh, you could retire, I think, with 65. But uh, the life expectancy was also 66 years. Now, the life expectancy in Europe is around uh, for men around uh, 79, 80 years, and for women about 83 years, and so forth. In the US, it's a bit lower, but it's also relatively high, say 77, 78 years. So the Social Security recipients, they could easily work another two years. Now, in France, the garbage collector, of course, they said, look, we have a tough job. We're not working like Mark sitting in a chair and he can work essentially all his life until he passes away. Our job is physical and it's hard work. By 55, we are done. Our friends in the construction industry that work on roofs, laying the steel. I tell you, with 40, 45, they're gone. Back pains and knee pains and everything. And the people that lay the tiles on the floor the knees are destroyed with 50. So different people have probably a uh, need for different retirement ages and so forth. That I can see. But 
in France, he wants to increase the retirement age and the French workers work less than other people in terms of work week. They're down to about 35 hours. He wants to increase it, I think, by two years. And there are strikes everywhere about this. And I, I partly understand because the workers argue, well, we worked so hard and we, you know, and this and that. So uh, I think the, the, the population is uneasy. We have demonstrations in Israel. We have demonstrations in Turkey. We have demonstrations everywhere. And a lot of it is not what the media writes. The American media is a liar, number one. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, cause is social uh, poor conditions. You know, people feel we earn less. And the Fed has the statistics. A 35-year-old today, inflation adjusted and inflation adjusted by the inflation figures the Fed calculates or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is not earning as much as his parents were mm -hmm. when they were 35, and he has less money, despite all the speculation in SPACs and meme stocks and so forth. Right, this and is, it, 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 the, the asset prices have risen so high that, that the things he aspires to are much more unaffordable to his generation than they were to the generation before. He can't buy it, period. He can't buy it. Yeah, so so back to my original question, Mark. So, how does this end? You know, do, do these countries have an elegant way of of somehow getting out of this? Or, and I'm going to use an extreme example here. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but but do does it go more the Sri Lankan route, where just it gets to a point where everybody doesn't have an, an option except rising up against who's running the country because it, it's just not working for them anymore. Well, uh, Sri Lanka has one problem. Uh, it's not the US. They can't print their money without right away feeling consequences. Yeah. The US still has the reserve currency, but that will come to an end, in my view. I don't know when, but it will come to an end. That we should all know. But I think uh, the easy option is what the Fed has enabled print money, mm -hmm. deficits. Which, of it course, will just end just... one day. It, it will end one day. But for now, as I said, in uh, Turkey, the country functions perfectly well with 80% inflation. Right. But you have said it's, it's, it's lit the fuse, right? You know that it can't yeah, do that forever. No, it won't have, last forever. I think we are in for a period, uh, the generation born just uh, at the end of the Second World War up to now, they were too young essentially to go to into the vietnam war or most of them and uh, they experienced in europe and in the us unprecedented increase in wealth among peace there was the cold war but it they didn't shoot at each other and so forth and uh, the chinese opened up in 78 after 1990 the country took off like a rocket and in India, as soon as they gave up the policies of isolation and socialism, the country boomed by about 8% growth per annum for the last 30 years. We have to see this. Uh, the, the capitalistic system, as soon as it was adopted in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in uh, Eastern Europe overall, and in Latin America and in uh, India, and Pakistan and so forth, and in China, Vietnam, led to very strong growth. This is a period unique in history. And we are destroying ourselves with, there was just an article the other day in the Wall Street Journal that from the, now actually in the Spectator, it's a very good paper because they are journalists that think something. Anyway, the article referred to Jefferson, <laughs> the Constitution, and how, as a society, we created newer and newer problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people think that, you know, 
th th that is the legacy of government. And the more <laughs> government you have, the more problems it creates, right? Yeah, of course. And the government has to expand to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. Um, so, gosh, there's so many places I could take that, but let me let me zero in on this. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about uh, the the BRICS countries really coming together, and even more swiftly in the wake of the Ukraine war. Um, given how the the West went to, uh, you know, has has iced out the Russians, and so the Russians are kind of, you know, cementing their own relationships. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk about a BRICS currency that's uh, in the works, and it's going to be a, a basket of commodities, but it's going to be priced in gold grams. Um, from your vantage point, how, how real is all of that? Well, the reality is that uh, every reserve currency, whether it was the pound or the Mexican peso and so forth, eventually they disappeared. Will it be a currency of BRICS countries? Uh, who knows? Because the the BRICS countries don't trust each other. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is a good much. point that, that a lot you of know? people ignore. Yeah, but uh, I think it, it could be a currency based on crypto technology, or it could be a currency based on gold. I think this is the most likely outcome that is based on a certain quantity of gold and silver uh, on a hard asset. But how soon this will happen? I mean, if you ask any Indonesian, Pakistani, Indian, Chinese, and so forth, uh, you go to their countries and you tell them, oh, you're a successful businessman and so forth. And, uh, you know, you have an account overseas, I can manage it and so forth. All these people, they hold assets in U.S. dollars, all of yeah. them. That is the reality. And until I can go to a wealthy Indonesian family or a wealthy uh, Malaysian or Thai family and say, look, you should invest in this uh, BRICS currency and so forth, it will take a lot of persuasion until they do it. If I go to them and say, you should invest some of your money in gold, that they will do. But they will also say, well, gold, you know, is not a good investment. We make much more in our stock market and the stock market is depressed and so forth and so on. So uh, nowadays, these people are quite sophisticated. They know the, that this is a big difference of the last 50 years. You see, 50 years ago, when the British Empire collapsed after the Second World War, the American Empire developed. Most people around the world, except for Europe, were uneducated economically and monetary-wise. You know, the, the lots of million, billionaires in Hong Kong, they started out as coolies, as coolies. I That's mean, amazing. Nothing at all. Sam Walton wasn't an educated person either. So uh, this is a, a world where now the children uh, ha have ed had education and so forth. Uh, they know very well, and they also read the papers and uh, the news and the social media, and they know that the world is not divided between the good U.S. and the evil empire, Russia and China and the evil India and all these big countries. All right. Well, look, when um, I grew up, we all believed in the U.S. We all admired the U.S. as children in Europe because the U.S. had made a major contribution in essentially defeating uh, the Germans. Right. And, and what's important here, to, I just want to give you a chance to underscore this, is there are some people that that listen to comments you make and other people like you make of oh the central banks are going to keep printing and uh the west is in decline and they think okay therefore our currency is going to be worth nothing tomorrow and there's going to be a new reserve currency and it's going to be the bricks and and um i you know what i hear you saying is is yes that may be the long-term trajectory but you you to be practical you know it takes a long time for 
habits and opinions and sentiment to shift. And it's not like the world is going to give up on the dollar right now. And to your point, very tellingly, you go to most countries and say, okay, I'll give you an equivalent amount in either US dollars or in your local currency. In most cases, people say, well, I'll definitely take the dollars, right? And that, that's not going to be given up overnight. I don't think so. And number two, you also have to look. I can have a deposit in, I can buy a 10 years a Japanese bond, it yields 0.5%. In the U.S., I buy it 10 years, it yields uh, 4%. I mean, close to 4%. So uh, why not invest in U.S. dollars for the next 10 years? Now, I if you told me you can invest in U.S. dollars for the next 10 years or in gold, I would choose gold. No question about this. Okay. And, and just elaborate on it for the viewer here. Well, I mean, I, I think whatever happens, say we have a scenario of deflation. Deflation, everything collapses, your wages, my wages, our houses collapse, everything. It is a complete calamity. Then I'm rather be in gold than in dollars because mm -hmm. the dollar obligations will not be paid. You know, if the real estate prices in America drop 30%, the massive bankruptcies. Yep. And it may happen in commercial. You know, the vacancy rate in uh, New York is now among commercial buildings, 22%. Wow. 22%. <laughs> we live in a world which is very interesting because for the last 200 years, the trend is urbanization. Now, I sit in Chiang Mai, I talk to you, I have Bloomberg on my computer. It was difficult to install it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then uh, you can live anywhere. I, if I were young and I was uh, so-called, um, how do they call them? The migrant workers or whatever. Uh, then I would go and live in a small village in Italy. It's almost free of charge. You can buy properties for nothing in the countryside. I, I've heard that literally like a dollar. I mean, you're, you're signing up for a lot of repairs, but yes. Yes, but if you are manually halfway normal, in other words, you had a hammer once a while in your hand, well, Americans with their foreign policy is always the hammer. <laughs> so they should be used to it. They can rebuild the house. <laughs> All right, Mark. Well, look, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Such a great discussion. Such a wonderful discussion for the conference. <laughs> and thanks for entertaining me with uh, this last set of questions here. Okay. Um, okay. Pleasure, my friend. Look forward to having you back on the channel soon. Okay. Very good. Bye-bye, Adam. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Mark has the best laugh of all time, doesn't he? It's a cross somewhere between Santa Claus and a James Bond villain. I love it. Well, if you enjoyed that bonus discussion with Mark, you're going to love his actual presentation for the conference in which he dives deep into his macro and market outlooks, as well as which assets he's holding right now for the road he sees ahead. To learn more about this weekend's conference, go to wealthion.com conference. There, you'll find the full agenda for the event, as well as all of the expert faculty we've lined up. We have former Federal Reserve economist Lacey Hunt kicking off the day as the keynote presenter. We'll then have Mark, followed by Michael Pento, former Fed advisor Daniel DiMartino Booth, Stephanie Pomboy, Michael Leibowitz covering the bond market, Rick Rule sharing dozens of his top picks for natural resource stocks, Doomberg on energy, Nick Jurley providing an update on the housing market, Mike Maloney with his outlook for the precious metals, Craig Wishner talking about investing in farmland, Lucky Lopez will join to discuss the auto market, and finally, we'll have Wealthion's endorsed financial advisors there all day for you to ask questions to. Oh, and everyone who registers will also receive a bonus video of Jeff Clark sharing his latest precious metals mining stock picks. To register, go to that URL, wealthion.com conference and sign up now as Saturday is only a few days away. Don't worry if you can't watch the event live. Replay videos of the entire event, all the presentations and all the live Q&As will be sent after the conference to everyone who's registered. And don't worry if you're watching this video after Saturday's conference has already happened. You can purchase those same replay videos over at that same wealthion.com conference URL. 
All right, I can't tell you how excited I am for this conference. We've done several of these now, and this one is shaping up to be our best yet, and perhaps our most important one as well, given its timing with all of the potential contagion that may soon spread from the banking system's sudden instability. I hope to see you there. And if you enjoyed this bonus video with Mark, please do me a favor and support this channel by hitting the like button, as well as clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks for doing that, and thanks for watching.